housekeeping matters before we continue. Please try to speak slowly. There is interpretation into the local languages. Additionally, please allow a few seconds at the end of my testimony, um, well, my statement before you start um, giving your account. And each time I ask you a question so that there won't be overlapping speech. Do you That's understand okay. that? That's okay. So for your testimony today, we will cover about five topics. Um, I understand that you will not be available tomorrow, and we were supposed to start with your testimony much earlier today. Therefore, today will be a bit of an abridged version of what we would have hoped to hear. And if necessary, then I will seek to admit the rest of your statement into evidence. Is that fine with you, sir? That's, that's okay. So the topics that we will address are your biographical details and academic qualifications. We will briefly just um, look at the structure and organization of the Gambia Students Union um, bet between 1999 and 2000, just so we have an understanding of what's to come. Then we will talk about the background. So the events that led to the student demonstrations of April 10 and 11, 2000. And then we will focus on the events of April 10 and 11 itself. And then we will briefly end with impact. So the bulk of your testimony will be about the events that led to the demonstrations as well as the actual activities that occurred on the day of the demonstration. Do you That's understand? Okay. So for the record, can you please state your full name? I am Lamin Jube. And Mr. Job, are you known by any other name? Yes, a household name, Job Keba, Lamin Keba. Can you tell us your date and place of birth? 11th of November, 1970, BM. And very briefly, your educational background, where you went to primary, secondary, and higher education. Briefly, I attended Iliasa Primary School between 1980 to 81, and then moved on to Brikama Kabafita Primary School, 81 to 88, where I sat for the common entrance exams, and then had admission at Brikama Secondary Technical School from 1988 to 1992, where I sat to the secondary fourth school living certificate examination in May, June, 1992, and then proceed to Nasir Ahmadiyya Muslim High School, where I completed my high school education and graduated with few credits, and then in 1998, I was enrolled at the Gamia College School of Education to pursue the higher teacher certificate program from 1998 to 2000. And then after completion, I was posted to Jarume Koto Basic Cycle School as an acting vice principal for two years, and then in 2002, I became the acting principal for two years as well. That is from 2002 to 2004. And then in September 2004, I was posted to Sololo Basic Cycle School. I started the school as a basic cycle school as an acting principal. And then I spent one academic year. From there, I came down to the University of the Gambia to pursue my first degree in education, where I did education, and my teaching subject was economics. And then after that, I was posted back when I completed in 19, uh, 2007, I was posted to Bansang Senior Secondary School, where I served as the vice principal up to 2014. And then 2014, I came down to the mainstream admin with the Ministry of Basic and Secondary Education. 
And then in 2015, I had a master's uh, a scholarship to pursue my MSc program in statistics with the University of Gaston Bercy. And I had my MSc degree in statistics just last June 2018. Um, that's a very good summary. Can you just tell us currently where you work and what I position work with the Ministry of Basic and Secondary Education. W what position do As you have? As an admin there? officer. Please allow a few seconds in between uh, our speeches. Okay, all it's right. It's easy to forget. Um, okay. Thank you for that. So in 2000, I want to take your mind back to the year 2000, which is what we're focused on. Were you a member of any student union in the Gambia? I was. I was a member of the Gambia College Students Sub-Union as the Information Minister from June 1999 up to June 2000. And the Gambia College Students Sub-Union has two components of students' union, because then at the time, Brikama Campus and Banjul Campus existed. Brikama Campus housed the uh, School of Education and that of School of Agriculture, while uh, the Banjul Campus housed the School of Nursing and School of Public Health. And so the need for a subunion to take care of or to take charge of the affairs of students within the Brikama Campus was necessary, and then there was a student subunion which I belong to. Nonetheless, you have the main union where the four schools or the four components of the Gambia College are part of the main union. And all these two, sub, uh, all these two unions are affiliated bodies to Gambia Students Union called GAMSU. So your role as information minister was within the subunion, is that correct? Exactly, but we equally work in partnership with the main union as well as GAMSU as well. So in 1999 to 2000, what was your um, role as information minister? What were your responsibilities? Basically is to make sure that the student body within the Brikama campus are better informed about the daily happenings of what is happening within the college. And equally, we are responsible for uh, the production of a newsletter of the student subunion. We equally organize a symposia, debates, quiz, literally exercises within the students in the uh, Brikama campus. So from what you've explained, it sounds as though the union was organized um, like some sort of um, administrative body essentially with ministers. Can we talk about the actual um, executive setup of GAMSU or the subunion as well as the leadership? Yes, the subunion like I said because many of the students fall within the School of Education. And so you realize that most of the school students are part of the School of Education, and it has the largest population. And I could also equally remember uh, 2000 was equally the same year when Gambia College for the first time registered a large or admitted a large number of students because our badge HTC was only 75 students. But the 900 plus started with, with, the, with the 2000 badge. So we have a larger body of students to take care of, and so that is that, is, that, is that component of it. So tell us a bit about um, how it was set up. Tell us about the executive members as well as the leadership. Yes, the executive comprises of the president, which at the time was Ali Ukan. The sub-union uh, sub president was Ali Ukan. Was there a vice president? The vice president was, at the time, Maurice Jerome Gomez. What about the main union? Who was the president during that period, 1999 to 2000? Uh, the main union president was Kebasar at the time. And Sajak Kamara was the information minister who I work hand in hand with. But who was the vice president of the main union at the time? 
The vice president, I could not recall that now, but I know Keba Sar was the president then. And in terms of your membership, you told us that you had a large body of students, is that correct? Yes. Do you recall roughly how many people fell under the subunion, which is where you were part of? This over a thousand plus. Over a thousand individuals? Yes, over a thousand. And was the, was the main union registered? Meaning they are all registered. All these two unions are registered, including Gamsu. Just allow a few seconds oh, okay, between right, our speeches. Okay. Um, and when you say they were registered, who were they registered with? Attorney General Chambers. So they were recognized as the body responsible for um, the welfare of the students generally? Yes. What else, what else fell within the mandate of the students' union? To promote unity among students, because at that time Gambia College was one of the highest institutions of learning, we really felt that to take charge of students, we obviously need to show examples. We need to show examples, and that was why the union, like I said, those portfolios were created. And just like you were asking, they are almost similar to a running government. So that, that obviously clearly shows how responsible and how organized the structure of the whole organization is. Likewise, the same thing has been extended to the main union. Were there mechanisms in place within the union to deal with, for instance, um, conflict or dispute resolution? Yes, of course. We have an advisory committee that is responsible for that. So if, for instance, um, there was a matter concerning a student, um, what kind of mechanisms does the union have in order to deal with that? Do you have investigative powers, for instance? Yeah, of course we do. Uh, the union, at the level of the subunion, we do. And then we are in, uh, we did our own part. We have to hand it down to the advisory committee to equally take its uh, uh, due process of the whole thing. Can you tell us a bit about the relationship between the union um, and the subunion with the authorities, for example? Were you considered independent at that time? We are, of course, very in independent. We are really very independent. So in 1999 to 2000, um, what was the relationship like with the authorities? It was, it was cordial because I would say we were the first group of people outside Kanilai who deemed it fitting. We went to the president's garden at, that, at the time in 1999 just to give a helping hand because then we saw the need, the efforts the government is trying to put into education. We felt there is that need and we went as a, as a group of students from the Gambia College, we went to Kanilai to help him on the gardens. So from what you're saying, you voluntarily took it upon yourself to go to the garden of the president to work? Yes. And for you, that's an example of the type of relationship that you had with the, the authorities at the time? That is one of them. What about the security forces? What was the relationship um, around 1999 to 2000 prior to the demonstrations? Normal, very normal on Korea. So let's talk about what happened um, in 2000, which then led to the actual demonstrations. Did you receive any information in your position as uh, Minister of Information of the subunion concerning um, a matter involving students and security forces? Precisely, if I will say the death of Ibrahim Obarib on the 9th March, which occurred on the 9th of March on Thursday, 2000. I was in class and then I had a group of students, uh, they, they called my attention and they asked if I know what was happening in, in, in Brikama. 
Then I inquired, and, and they said a student was killed by fire officials. Then I... Sorry, when you say by fire officials, um, you mean officials of the fire service? Exactly. The... Please continue. Then I tried to look for Aliu and few other executives, members of the subunion. And by Aliu, you're referring to Aliu, Aliu Khan, Khan? Yes, the, the, sub -union, uh, the subunion president. Yes. And then we convene an emergency meeting. In that meeting, we discuss on the issue of the dead surrounding Ibrahim Abadi's dead. Because one narration said it that, or has it that, he was given cement to eat. So there were so many, 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 many things coming out. So we do not know which one is which. So we said then we have to go down to the school and find out because equally, if what was reported is true, then there is a disciplinary problem. And also at the level of the school, there is a problem there administratively. So I just want to focus on the meeting that was called. Um, was it held on the same day that you received the information, meaning yes, the 9th of March? Yes, this meeting was held, emergency meeting was held the same day. You mentioned Aliu Khan. Can you tell us um, who else was present at that meeting apart from you? Uh, almost all, this, all, the, all the executive members of the subunion, some main union executive members were also there, and Gamsu uh, 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 representatives or Gamsu executive members who were part of the college then were also there because Alaji Esdabo is one of them or was one of them. And Alaji S. Dabo's role at that time was? He was the Vice President Gamsu. Of Gamsu. Yes. Um, so at that meeting, it was to discuss the, um, the information you received about Ibrahim Abari? Y yes. Can you tell us um, what decisions were made at that meeting? In the meeting, we came to a conclusion that we need to go down to the school to do our investigation. But before the investigation, we need to equally address the general student body at the school because we saw a disciplinary co uh, problem emerging. And this was what we agreed upon. And then the following Monday, because this was on a Thursday, the following Monday, which happens to be on the 13th of March, then we went to, we left the college. A five-man delegation was set up, including myself, Alaji S. Dabo, the Vice President Gamsu, Saja Kamara, Information Minister, Main Union, Bubakar Sise, part of Subunion, and Molo Balde Gamsu. We left the college. What was uh, Molo Balde's um, role at that time? I, I, couldn't, I couldn't remember that now. I know he, I knew at that time he was part of the executive of Gamsu. So to make sure I understand, this um, team of five people were responsible for conducting some kind of inquiry into what happened to Mr. Ibrahim Abari. Is exactly. That right? Who was the leader of this group? I led the team. And that was in your capacity as information? Information minister, exactly. Please tell us what happened on the Monday when you went to, where did you go? On mon that Monday, we left college around between 12 and 1, because we understood this, the, the, the school at Foster's operates on, a, on an afternoon shift. Why did you go to Foster's? What's the connection between Foster's and Mr. Barry? That was where the incident happened. That was where the problem happened. So Mr. Ibrahim Barry was a student at Foster's? Was a student at uh, Foster's senior secondary school. But these two class, class, cl uh, these two grade 10 classes were housed under Brekama Technical Training Center. So they were housed at, at, at Brekama Technical Training Center, known as the old site, while the 11, grade 11 class and the 12 classes are at the new site. So at that time, Mr. Ibrahim Abari was um, was a student in grade 10, is that correct? Exactly. Okay, please continue. So we left college around 12 and 1, between 12 and 1. 
we decided that our first port of call is going to be Brikama Police Station. We went to Brikama Police Station. We register our concern as to the information we received regarding the death of a student at Foster's school. And they, in turn, gave us a CID officer. But what I could not remember is whether we went along at that same spot with the CID officer to the school or the CID officer joined us later at the school. That is what I could not say for certain. But we obviously we are assigned a CID officer. And the CID officer along brought three witness state, uh, statement forms, which we took along. So prior, I just want to understand, prior to assigning a CID officer to your team to um, help you with the investigations you were conducting, do you know if the police had already began conducting their own investigations no, when I, you went I, there? I, I don't know. Did they say anything to the effect that they had already started their own investigations? I couldn't remember that. So from what you know, you informed them of what you were doing. They seemed um, willing to assist by giving a CID officer um, exactly. to assist you. Exactly. Please continue. So we went down to Foster's school. We went to the senior master's office, who was at the time called Mr. Ajao. He was the one responsible for the school. We introduced ourselves, and we told him about our coming to the school, which was, of course, very much welcomed by him. And we told him the need for us to even start to address the students, if that is equally possible, at an assembly, which he consented to. And then we were given that forum, the students were gathered, and then we spoke to the students at length on matters of discipline, on matters of respecting their teachers, because their teachers are their everything. So it is obviously very much important and key for students to realize this. This was one of the things we obviously discussed with them. And then from there, then we had an interview. The senior teacher responsible for the school, Mr. Ajao, was interviewed. The class teacher of Ibrahim Abari, Ms. Kamara, at the time was also interviewed. Ibrahim Abari's friend, whom he was sitting with that same or that fateful day, was also interviewed by the name Alaji Gianna. Was it only those three individuals that you interviewed? The father, Ibrahim Abari's father, by the name Ali Obari, was also interviewed because from the school we went to the house of Ibrahim Abari and then we met the father. So let's focus on the interviews that were conducted at the school. Yes. Um, who did you interview first, do you recall? Mr. Ajao, of course, the senior teacher. Can you tell us what, he, um, what information he provided you with? He said Ibrahim had a problem with the commerce teacher by the name Mr. Paul. And so Ibrahim fought with Mr. Paul. And after the fight, Ibrahim went home, was asked to go home. And when he went home, the following day, he came back to school. According to him, he said, then when he realized Ibrahim was in school and was in class, went to the far side at Brikama to report the matter to one of the fire service officials, to only come with him to go to the school and escort Ibrahima out of the classroom and be handed down the suspens uh, suspension letter. Did Mr. Jawa explain to you why um, he went to the fire service regarding um, an internal disciplinary matter at the school? I believe because maybe because he was a foreigner, he must have some trouble sometimes in, 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 in dealing with some of those situations, I believe. When you say he was a foreigner, where was he from? He's, he's, we made to understand he was a Fritonian. So he, first of all, at that point, did you know where the fire service was located? Because I'm Only trying to understand why he went to the fire station. 
very close. It was very close to the school, only about about 150, 200 meters away, or 300 meters away from the school, if I'm not wrong. And from what he explained, the reason why he went to get a member of the fire service was so this individual could witness the suspension of Mr. Barry. Exactly. That's what he told you. Exactly. That's exactly what he told me. What else did he tell you? So he said what happened and then when he appeared with the fire officer they called Ibrahima out Ibrahima came out and then they went to the office he was handed down the suspension letter and then he went off with the fire service officer based on your experience um, as someone who was part of the students union had you ever had a situation like this where the school contacts the fire service in order to deal with a disciplinary matter. It is an anomaly. It is not normal. So you were equally surprised by that? Then? Exactly. Okay. Um, what happened? Did he provide any other information or did you get the rest of the information from the Yes, he did. He did provide information because that was not the end uh, with him. Then when Ibrahim went away with the fire service uh, officer, he said shortly after when they left, they returned with the father. The fire service officer, Ibrahim and Ibrahim's father. Which equally corroborates with that of what Alaji Gianna, the friend, told us. And we'll get to Alaji Gianna. Okay, all right. Please continue with Mr. Ajao. Okay. So when they appeared, the father pleaded with Mr. Ajao, that he never knew that Ibrahim had a problem the previous day at school, because Ibrahim didn't tell him anything. So Ajao, the father, went along, I think, with somebody accompanied him, an old man. They succeeded in convincing uh, Mr. Ajao, because according to uh, uh, Ajao, when they went through the records of Ibrahim, obviously they found out that he was not obviously that unruly student as one might thought. So he succeeded, the father succeeded in pleading with Mr. Ajao, and then he, that they pleaded, uh, they, he accepted, and then was asked to come back after Tobaski, because then it was very close to Tobaski. So Mr. Ajao accepted um, the apology made by Ibrahima's father on his behalf, and then said Ibrahima could return to school after Tobaski. Is that Exa correct? E exactly. Please continue. What, what else happened? So this was what he said, and that was the last time when he saw Ibrahima until the next day on the night, rather the, yes, on the night when they had the news of the death of Ibrahima. What was Mr. Ajawa's reaction to um, what happened to Mr. To Mr. Barry Ibrahima? Very regretful, very regretful. Is that to say he did not expect this to be the result of getting the fire service involved in a disciplinary matter? Of course, because at the, by, the, by the end of his story, he burst, burst into tears. Interview with Mr. Ajao, who did you interview next? The class teacher, Ms. Kamara. Can you tell us what Ms. Kamara told you? Corroborated almost the same story and equally added that Ibrahim was indeed an average student. He do participate very well in the class, but most of the time he will not say anything. He would rather left to be alone, concluded the sobbing and tearful class teacher as well. Did she also provide any information as to um, Ibrahima's general behavior in class? That was, yeah, exactly. That was what I said. He said she said Ibrahima was an average student, very hardworking, and take part in the class discussions. But sometimes he will not. He will just be alone. He will not say anything. But she, she didn't highlight any kind of disciplinary issue? In she did not. 
So let's talk about your interview with Ibrahima's friend. I believe he provided you with a lot more detail about what happened. Exactly. Mr. Alaji Gianna. Gianna. Yes. Please tell us about that. Alaji Are you okay, Mr. Job? Yes. Should I give you a, f a few seconds? It's okay. There's some water on the table as well. Please no, feel free. It's, it's okay. Okay. He said they were sitting at the back of the classroom. When Mr. Paul, the time for commerce lessons, entered the classroom and asked them to relocate from where they were sitting in the, at the back of the classroom to come in front. When they came in front, they sat where the sun has its rays. And then, according to Alaji, Mr. Paul asked him to relocate, but left Ibrahim where he was. So Ibrahim complained that because the sun has its rays there, so it's going to be impossible for him to sit there because it is obviously affecting his eyesight. And then he insisted that he would not sit there. And then he got up from where he was, trying to move to another seat where it is clear. So it was during the course of this, a heated debate ensued between the primer and the class teacher, uh, and the commerce teacher, Mr. Paul. And then according to Alaji, all of a sudden then called Mr. Paul scolded Ibrahim. And then Ibrahim couldn't stand it and then gave him a hard punch on the face. And then a, f a, a fight broke out. So they were separated, and then Ibrahim was asked to go home and went home. So the following day, when he... Do you recall on which date this occurred, this event that you're talking about, the fight between um, This the was on the 7th Ibrahim. of March. 7th of March. On a Tuesday. So the day they had Ibrahim had a problem with the commerce teacher, Mr. Paul. It was the following day, on the eighth of March, on a Wednesday, when Ibrahim came back to school. What did Elijah tell you about what happened when Ibrahim came back to school on the eighth? Yes, according to Elijah, when he came back to school the following day, Wednesday, they were in class when a Jao appeared with a fire service officer and they called Ibrahim out. So that was the last time Alaji said he saw Ibrahim for the school session. Then he didn't see him for the rest of the day and he went home. And then he was there too in the evening. He said, let him go and see what is happening with Ibrahim. He went to the house. Before that, did um, Alaji provide you with any information about who the fire service officer was? For example, did he recognize um, the serviceman? No, he did not. Okay. So what happened that evening when Alaji went to visit um, Mr. Ibrahim Barry? So Alaji went to Ibrahim's house in the late evening, found Ibrahim was in pain, Ibrahim was crying. His voice was not even very clear to hear. And he started asking him what went wrong. And Ibrahim started telling him that he was beaten mercilessly. And he was poured on, water was poured on him repeatedly. And his hair was even forcefully shaved off. Who did all of those things the to him? The fire officials. That's what he told Alaji. Exactly, the fire officials. When we come back to the father's story, that will also confirm that. So he spent, he said he spent much of the time with Ibrahim. And Ibrahim was all along telling him that he's going to die. And he started telling him that, no, you are not going to die. Things will be okay. You will not die, you will surely live. So he said he was there until up till it was a little bit late, and then 
he departed. He left Alaji. Only to realize the following day that Ibrahim was pronounced dead. The fire station that Alaji referred to, was it, um, where was it located? Was it also in Brikama or else? The fire station. Yeah, it's in Brikama. So it's the Brikama fire station. It's just a walking distance from the school where Ibrahim attended. And so from the information that Alaji gave you and the other um, investigators, essentially, conducting the inquiry, he said it's the fire service officials who beat um, Ibrahim Abari mercilessly. Exactly. Poured water on him. Exactly. And forcefully shaved his head. Exactly. So when Ibrahim came home that day, he was in a lot of pain. Exactly. That's the information you received exactly. from Alaji. Exactly. What else did he tell you about um, Ibrahim? Yeah, he also said after when he was released from the fire station, he went to Brikama Health Center. And according to the nurse told him they can't treat him until when he comes, uh, when he reports the matter to Brikama Police Station, and which he did. Because when I asked him, he confirmed that. Ibrahim said he went to report the matter uh, to Brikama Police Station and then came back to the health center before he went home that same evening. So after your interview with um, all these three individuals at the school, at Foster's, um, the Foster School, you said you then went to Ibrahim Abari's house and interviewed his father. Exactly. Is that correct? Exactly. And the father also provided you with information. Please tell us what information he provided. Exactly. We reached at the house almost close to nightfall around Maghrib. We this is still on the 10th of March, right? Yeah, exactly. Nine, on the 9th. Sorry, on the 13th, 13th. It is on the 13th of March, on Monday. Okay, 13th yes. of March. Please yes. continue. Thanks for that clarification. Yes. We found the father by the name Ali Ubari. We introduced ourselves and we told him why we were at the house because we are equally students at the Gambia College and we are concerned and we equally heard about the news of the demise of his son. And so we went to the school to find out from exactly what had happened at the school level. And then there we are to equally find out from him, ask the father to know exactly what had happened so that we know exactly what to report back to the general student's body. He welcomed it, he welcomed us, and then he started his story. The old man swore sternly before he started telling us anything, that he was a Muslim, and he is only going to tell us what he knew about the death of his son, not on the account that because his son is dead, he will try to say anything that he didn't know about, and continued him, or continued the, uh, Mr. Ali Ubari. He said he knew about the problem on the 8th of March, 2000, on a Wednesday, when Ibrahim was suspended. And he appeared before him at the market because he was selling at Brikama Market, which is not also very far from the school. Ibrahim went with the fire officer at the market, found him there. And then the fire officer told him about the incident that had happened at the school that Ibrahima is an unruly child because he fought with the teacher and so Ibrahima will be disciplined. And then the father said, but I wasn't aware of all this because Ibrahima didn't tell me that he had a problem at school the day before. So can you uh, help me we go back to the school 
so that I can talk to the master or the, or the school authorities, which he equally succeeded in doing. That was the time they returned to school with an old man, like I told you, who accompanied them to the school to meet Mr. Ajao, the CDO master, responsible for the school at the time. So when they arrived, Mr. Barry told us he succeeded in pleading with Mr. Ajao. Like I said, they didn't find any previous undis uh, indisciplinary uh, uh, issues surrounding Ibrahim, so it was easier for Ajao to uh, uh, accept the, uh, uh, to forgive Ibrahim. And then from there, they were going, the fire officer told him again, reminded him that they are going to take Ibrahim along to the fire station where he will be safe off because he is not disciplined. So according to, me, according to him, he thought they were only trying to make him scared. When they go there, they perhaps will not do anything to him. That was his belief. Fathers, the Ibrahim's fathers, fathers yeah, exactly. and Mr. And then that was the time he returned to the market. Only to realize that in the late evening, when Ibrahim came back, was called upon to see Ibrahim's condition, was in pain, seriously, and he told us, Ibrahim said the same thing, he was beaten mostly, water was poured on him repeatedly, and his hair was also saved up forcefully. And Ibra did Ibrahim tell him who did that to him? The fire officers. That's what his father said. Exactly. Please continue. So he said they managed that night. But Ibrahim's condition was not, was not, was not uh, uh, improving. Instead, it was deteriorating. They managed with that until Early morning on the 9th of March, on Thursday, he left the house early for the market. According to him, he first left early morning, so he went to the market. But just arriving at the market, he was called back again to say Ibrahim's condition has now worsened. He came back. On his way going back to the house, according to Ali Ubari, he met with them on their way back to the health center in a vehicle. And they stopped. He joined them. And according to him, the time he went into the car, he found Ibrahim dead. But as the head of the family, he didn't disclose it. He could not disclose it at that time. He has to swallow that bitter pill at that moment. And then he continued with them to the, to the, to the health center. Upon arrival, Tests were performed on him and later pronounced dead. So this was exactly what he said. Did he provide you with any information as to the cause of Ibrahim's death? Was he told anything by the doctors or did he just come to his own conclusions? Whether Ali Ubari was the cause of Ibrahim's death. Did he, did Ali Ubari, the father, At the tell health you? center. Yes, tell I'm not you. sure. He didn't tell us anything about that. He didn't say anything about that. He only said before they even arrived at the health center, Ibrahim was obviously dead. He knew that. And when they reached at the health center, when doctors or nurses performed tests on him, also pronounced him dead. And from what you have said, um, the information you gathered was he was at the fire station until later that day. He came home. He informed at least his father and um, his best, his friend, Alaji, that it was servicemen that beat him, that poured water on him repeatedly and shaved his head. And that when he, when he was at home, he was in pain. Is that correct? Yeah. Did they tell you anything about um, his condition as far as they could, um, they could tell just from looking at him? Did they observe anything in particular about his condition? The, the family of Ibrahim? Either the father or his friend, Alaji. Uh, can you repeat that again? I want to know if whether when they looked at Ibrahim, they could observe any, um, 
they could observe anything in terms of his condition that evening? Of course, because being in pain alone is, is, is something observable. It's something that you can see struggling. And, and according to Alaji, like I said, Ibrahim's voice was not even clear. It was even difficult for him to hear what he was trying to tell him. So all those things speak volumes of exactly what had happened. Did they mention anything about injuries? No, they, didn't, they, they didn't mention anything of physical injury okay. that they could see. Mm. But obviously, from all accounts, um, they could tell that he was in a difficult situation. Sure. I know that um, Alaji did not provide you with any name of the fire service uh, man that came to the school. What about the father? Was he able to provide you with a name? No. Okay. And in the course of your investigations, were you able to find out um, the names of any of the fire service yeah, yeah, involved? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How did you come to find that information? Foreign and newspaper, because I, I, I equally have been reporting to Foreign and newspaper. So, and again, uh, at the Gambia College, uh, we are always been given copies of all these newspapers, Daily Observer, Independent, Foreign, uh, the information uh, minister is always giving all these copies, ev all, almost every publication. So what did they publish about uh, the names of the individuals involved in Mr. The, fire, the, 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 the seven fire officials being alleged, the names are there in one of the newspapers I had. Well, we will follow up on that. Um, thank you for that information. So having um, gathered all that information about what happened to Mr. Ibrahim Abari, what did the student union do after that? We, re we, we report back to the college executive and to the general student re, through the notice board, because at the college at the time, the notice board was our everything. All communications to the students comes through the notice board. So that happened, and equal executive were briefed about our findings, which we put it to them. And I, a meeting was convened, I think, on the 20th of March, because then there was a break between that 13 to on the 20th. 20 years, the Tobaski came in, and then there was a break. Before we talk about the, um, the meeting of the 20th March, what was the mood like amongst the students um, as a result of what happened to Mr. Ibrahim Abari? It was really frustrating. You could imagine what was going on in almost everybody's mind if we've gone that far in this country, school matters, getting into the hands of wrong people, and at the end of the day, only to receive dead. If we could all imagine what that, ki uh, what that kind of uh, situation is going to lead us to. So people were worried all over. We are all worried, because we are all asking the same question, who next? Nobody knows. It could be me, it could be the other guy. So that was why in solidarity, and in unison as a responsible student body. We went down to the level of the school, to the house of Ibrahima, to gather all this information so that we will not at any point in time misinform the student's body so that they will know exactly what had happened. In fact, one of the um, rumors you mentioned earlier was that you received information that Ibrahim Abari was given cement to eat. Based on your investigations, um, did that turn out to be true? The father obviously dispelled that, and nor no, no did Alaji also talk about that, nor uh, uh, either uh, uh, the senior master or the class teacher. We, we didn't find that story to be correct. But however, somebody somewhere in the independent newspaper concluded that Ibrahim was caught stealing, which is, 
which is very, 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 very wrong, which is not true. So you're saying that one of the reports was that by the independent newspaper? Exactly. Was that um, Ibrahim was caught stealing? Exactly. And that's something, at least based on what, what you've said, that's not correct? Very, 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 very wrong. It was a disciplinary issue between him and a teacher that led to the involvement of the fire service? Exactly. Thank you for that clarification. Um, can you tell us what happened um, on the meeting of the 20th March 2000? I briefed the student executive about our findings, and we came to a conclusion that we should go on a peaceful demonstration so that a wake-up call will be sent to the authorities. Because up to that time, there hasn't been any arrest that has been effected in connection to the dead of anybody. We need to understand. So, when they were brief, this is exactly, we told them exactly our findings surrounding his death, and then so the need to march to the commissioner's office at the, at the time. Then that was Keba Sise. And equally, the charity that we collected at the college level will also be given to the family house from the commissioner's office. Then we would have paid our condolence to the family. That was exactly what was discussed in that meeting on the 28th of March. So the purpose of staging the demonstration was because the student union felt that no action had been taken by the authorities. Is that correct? Exactly. And the march was to end at the commissioner. Is that um, in Brikama? Yes, the march is to start at the gate of the college to the commissioner's office from there to Ibrahima's house where we will give the family house the charity and then back to the college. What happened after that? Did, the, um, did you proceed with the demonstration? We did. On Wednesday, on the 22nd of March, we did. We gathered the students. The students were reliably informed of what we should do. Prior to that, did you inform any of the authorities that you were about to stage a demonstration? I, I'm not aware. We do not. Was there any particular reason why you decided not to do so? Yeah, because we, we, we only wanted to go to the commissioner to show the commissioner about our frustrations and equally to pay condolence to the bereaved family. So no, um, no sort of permit or information was provided informing the authorities that you were about to stage a demonstration? No, we didn't do that. Okay. So what happened on the 22nd? So early morning on Wednesday, on the 22nd of March, we gathered at the gate of the college. I could remember the then PEO at uh, Region 2, Mr. Kaka Isanyan, coming out from the regional office, finding out as to why we are gathered there and what we are about to do. And we told him exactly what we wanted to do. And he started pleading with us that we should not go ahead with the demonstration, rather we should take time and then listen to them and see what is going to happen. And we said, no, we are not going to do that. We're going to go ahead with our planned demonstration. We said it's going to be a peaceful demonstration. We are not going out to do any other thing. We only want to go to the commissioner, the head of the division, to know exactly what had happened and, uh, and equally know about our frustrations and equally to pay condolences to the Berry family. We didn't see much big deal with that. So he called the principal, the then principal, Jenu Mane, and the then registrar of Gambia College, S. Mane. And they all, all joined him out. They found us at the college gate. We told them the same thing. So we went ahead. We walked. The student leaders were in front. We hold each other's hand, one another's hand in front, the executive members, and the rest of the students' body f followed. Were you carrying any kind of signs or... Um Placards, for instance? Yes, we do. We are carrying placards, writings. Who killed Ibrahim Abari? Justice delayed is justice denied. Who raped Bintabari? Sorry, uh, I, I, I. Bintamane? Bintamane, exactly. 
So at that time, you had already received information that um, Bintamane was raped. Exactly. We also had information which Gamsu was also working on. Can you tell us what you know about um, the incident related to Bintamane? What exactly did you hear? According to uh, the, see, they came on a, uh, an athletic competition at the Independent Stadium. I think it was during the course of that she was raped, according to, by some unknown paramilitary officers. That was what was alleged. So that's exactly what was also happening, and the issue was obviously with Gamsu. They were also on it, trying to investigate it to find out exactly who did that. So, and all of a sudden, this other incident also happened at Brikama, so we tend to put the two together. Um, you said that it was during um, some kind of sports at the stadium, which would have meant that Bintamani was a student at that time. Is exactly. That um, so just to make sure we understand, Gamsu, the main union, was investigating the issue related to Bintamane, the alleged rape by um, paramilitary officers, from what you've said. And then your subunion was focused on the death of Mr. Ibrahim Abari, which was at the hands um, of the fire station, allegedly. Exactly. Okay. Um, please continue with um, the demonstration. So we walked down to the commissioner's office. But it was not easy because we, 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 the crowd we were going with, at some point we were not comfortable, simply because people are too much. And then we tried to go through the other way. Sorry, so just a second. You said because at some point the crowd was, um, you were uncomfortable about the crowd, people were too many. Yes. Um, were these other students joining in or were they individuals from around the neighborhood? Could you tell? I would probably say yes. Someone look us, obviously, particularly when we were returning from the house at the market end. We could no longer control the students. We could no longer control the crowd. The number just get it was just increasing. Well, let's focus on um, your journey from the Gambia College as you were going. You said at some point the crowd grew bigger and you felt, um, is it uncomfortable? Is that the word you used? Yes, yes. Um, was it because of the size of the crowd or was there something else to it? Yeah, exactly, because of the size of the crowd. So we went to the commissioner's office. I believe before we even arrived, uh, we found they were already ready because we, uh, he must have received news of our coming uh, because Kaka is signing himself, uh, police officers, the commander commanding, I think, Brikama Division, Brikama uh, 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 Police uh, 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 Station Officer, Brikama Police Station, we are all there, we found them, and the chief of Combo, Combo Central. You mentioned Kaka is signing, who is, who is that? Was he he a was the principal education officer at the time responsible for Region 2. So all these authorities were aware that your group was coming, and so you found them at the commissioner's office in exactly. Brikama. Tell us what happened there. We even met the group outside the commissioner's office to receive us. And Aliu, our president, main union president, uh, delivered a short speech regarding the death of Ibrahim Abari and our investigation into the death of Ibrahim Abari. And up to that time, we didn't hear any news of apprehending those people responsible. So we were really very much worried and we are very much concerned and we felt that was the time for us to visit him, to tell him about our frustrations for him to know exactly about that. What was the reaction of the authorities that you met um, in relation to your concerns? It was, it was really okay. It was really cordial because they really assured us that justice will be done and, and, and they will make sure that it is, they speed it up 
to make sure that uh, 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 what we are complaining about uh, are obviously taken care of. Now, was, that assurance was obviously given. So did you have the impression at that point that steps were being taken to investigate it? Following I would the say I had the impression that steps would be taken. So they were promising that they would actually do something about it, not that they had already started doing exactly. it. Exactly. That was your understanding Exactly. Of it. Um, what else happened during that meeting? That was the short meeting, and then we left for the disease house. Did they um, try to stop the demonstrations in any way? No, they don't. They don't. They don't. They don't. So at that point, with police officers and everyone present, you registered your concerns, they responded in order to assure you, and then you proceeded to Mr. Ibrahim Abari's house, is that correct? Exactly. Um, please tell us what happened when you arrived there. So at the house, we found the family, we introduced ourselves, and we told them about why we are there. Speaker after speaker, but it was so emotional. You could now see the emotional outburst. We could no longer control people. People are now seriously crying and wailing. On Lucas tend to join to be part of the crowd. Now the crowd is even bigger, almost three times bigger than the crowd we came along from the college. So we begin to really be very much equally scared about the consequences, because we knew, obviously, we're going back to the college, and we are to pass via uh, the fire service, then we knew, obviously, it's going to be problematic. So up until um, Mr. Ibrahim Abari's house, the demonstration had been peaceful. Um, it grew in size, but at the house, that's where emotions started running high. And then you started to get really concerned about what could happen on the journey back. Um, did you take any steps at that point based on that realization that things could get out of hand? Yeah, before we even departed the house, we, we started addressing the students again. We said, yes. We knew obviously this is really going to be the outcome of coming to the house. We cannot obviously stop that emotional outburst, but we obviously are pleading to make sure that that is to make sure that we observe our ultimate objective, and that is a peaceful demonstration, so that the authorities will realize what had happened and why are we out in the street. So we should not go against that. We obviously warned them. What was the reaction of the crowd in general to those warnings? Like I said, it is, it's like at that point in time, almost everybody is in tears. So it's like you assume that things will go fine. But in our minds, obviously, we know obviously it's going to be problematic. That We know that. So you felt it would things um, would be problematic, but at the same time, you felt that um, people had been given warnings and perhaps things would be fine. Yes. Tell us what happened after that. So we came up to almost where the now Brikama community radio station is. We wanted to take the other road leading to, to avoid the fire uh, 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 station at all. But we could not. There's only few who followed us, and then the rest turned the other way around going towards the fire uh, station. So we have to follow them. So your attempt to avoid um, any kind of um, reaction was not only to warn um, the people present, was to also try to change your route. Exactly. But that didn't happen. Exactly. So instead, people still took the same route towards the fire station and the Gambia College. And you said you followed them as well. Exactly. So at this point, you, pe you were not leading, but you were being led. Is that ex correct? Ex exactly. Exactly. That was the tone of events. So there we are 
a rain down of stones, like we expected from, from students, me. from those who join the, 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 the students. Because like I said, the crowd is now three times bigger than the crowd we came along from the college. So around what area were stones being thrown and at what or at who? Around, 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 uh, around the gate of the fire service. And in fact, they stormed the, fire, they, they, they stormed the whole fire service uh, compound, the premises. They had to run, to, to, to run for their lives. So at this point, it's the students attacking the fire station with stones and entering the fire station itself, y yeah, which led yes, to the servicemen fleeing. Yes. At this point, were you able to control any, anything? We, 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 we tried very well. We tried, we pursued them until when we saw a Land Rover full of paramilitary officers, about 10, 15 men, <laughs> they came down, they were just standing, looking at them, because they can't do anything. They can't do anything. I'm not saying I've never seen that, such of a, uh, that type of a crowd, but it's one of the biggest crowds I have ever seen. Because, like I said, it's like three times the size of the, 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 the population we came along with. So we, we tried until when obviously people thought the windscreens of the fire ambulances were all broken down into pieces, obviously. I think this was what, when they realized that happened, then that was the time students, people started retreating out of the premises and then we were able to regroup them and then back at the college. So you told us that at this point, they were three times the size of the group that you left Gambia College with. Can you give us an estimate of how big your demonstration was? This number could be, could be, could be close to above, well over, around 5,000. So generally, let's because just say is, a large... It's, it's the market area. So automatically it attracts a lot of people. Students and non-students. Exactly. Apart from the fire station and the damage caused, um, including to the ambulances, did any other um, property or building suffer damage? No, it was only the fire station and the fire ambulances, which windscreens were all broken into pieces. Apart from using stones, was anything else used to damage, to cause damage? I, I, I didn't see anything of that nature. Apart from the damage to property, was there any injury caused um, to anyone as far as you know? I, I didn't also see that. So not to any member of um, your group, the demonstrators, or to the um, fire service? Yeah, not to my knowledge. Okay. So you told us that the group, um, everyone regrouped, and you continued presumably to Gambia College. Exactly. Um, tell us what happened there. Then at the Gambia College, we found, I can say the college was strong with security officials all over, security heads from all over. We found them, and we were summoned to the principal's office for a meeting. And I could remember Tatin Baji, then the CMC commandant, was there. CMC, as in Crime Management Unit? Yes. Um, do you recall his, his full name? Banding Baji. Banding Baji, a.k.a. 13 Baji. Yes. Um, which other security... Um, the Commissioner police? of Police, West Coast. Do you recall who that was at the time? I, I could not recall that. The Commissioner himself, Kebasise. Commissioner of Brikama. Yes. Yes. The Chief of Combo Central, the Mosantam Bojang, was also present. Um, was anyone else present? Yeah, some immigration. I think immigration boss or representative from the immigration were there. State House were there. NIA were there. What about the IGP? Was he present? 
I think he was there. I think the IGP was there. The permanent secretary for the Department of State for Education at the time, Dr. Jalo, was also there. I said Jalo. You said, I believe the IGP was present. Are you sure or you're not sure? I, 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 I'm not very sure. Okay. Um, so what happened during that meeting? In this meeting, they all expressed concern about our actions to demonstrate without a permit and to also demonstrate as a result it led to the damage of those fire ambulances. So most of them that's exactly what they were of concern until when we were given the opportunity to air out exactly how we were feeling. And then Tatin Baji then came in and then said, it was really not our fault. We should have been put in the picture regarding the dead or investigations uh, regarding the dead of Ibrahim Abari. And so he, at that time, handed over the post-mortem report to me, which I made a comprehensive report with the investigations we did at the school level with the, with the father of Ibrahim Abari, and it was published on Forea, on the, 20, the 25th edition of Forea newspaper. So in fact, from what um, Mr. Landing Baji told you, 13 Baji, it turns out that the police were conducting some kind of investigation. Is that the impression he gave you? With that the was, yeah, exactly. That was the impression given, that they were doing some investigations. But we didn't see any, any, anything of that and or the any serious investigation. And the post-mortem report that he gave you, you provided um, a copy this morning, which I have with me. So I will ask that um, someone gives it to you so that you can confirm whether or not this is the document you gave me. And that would be a post-mortem report concerning the death of Mr. Ibrahim Barry. That's OK. Mr. Chairman, I note yes, that um, we have five Excuse minutes. Me. This is the same. It's the same. One copy, one copy. Just give me one and then give her the other copy, if that is possible. I'll just... So, in fact, uh, Mr. Job, I'll just give it to you as it is, and yeah. then you can read um, from it. Okay. But I wanted to seek a, okay. a, a point um, with okay. the chairman. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we have about five minutes left, and because um, the witness this morning took much longer than anticipated, Mr. Job is unfortunately not available tomorrow. And so I ask the indulgence um, of the commissioners for 30 minutes in order to address the rest of his testimony. Understood, we may continue, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. So Mr. Job, is that the document that 13 Baji handed over to you? Yes. The head of the um, crime management? Yes. Unit. Um, can you read what it says at the top of that document? I sometimes battle with my eyesight, so I don't know. It says Health Laboratory Services or Service Royal Victoria Hospital, Banjul de Gambia, date 10th March 2000, time 11, uh, sorry, 12 a.m. Strictly confidential. On the instructions of the, coro uh, of the corona of Brikama, the undersigned on this day carried out a postmortem examination within the mortuary of this institution on the body of Ibrahim Abari, which was identified in my presence by the following persons. Sekou Bari, uncle, 
of Brikama Perseverance, Kebabari Broda of Brikama Perseverance, present, present at the identification was first class 448 Kalilu Jao, I think it's Jao. The, the writing is, is, is fading. My findings are as follows. External examination. If I could just stop you there. Can you tell us who, um, if you turn the page over, can you tell us who is the author of that report, the post-mortem report? It's Dr. Rafael Rizzo, the histopathologist. And this would be at the RV, well. T RVH, yes, at the time. At the time, RVH. Yes, yes. Um, perhaps we can just skip to the cause of death. Okay. And then you will um, tell me what you understood from um, the report. So if you can read the portion that says, that says the cause of death. Yes, cause of death. In fact, in fact, of the right lung located in the middle loop and based with severe hemorrhage, necrosis, severe oedema of both lungs, acute respiratory insufficiency, hepatic esteatosis. Yes, that's the cause of the death. And what did you understand by that? From this, it means not a natural cause. And when you received this report, your understanding of it was that his death was a result of internal complications. Yes. Is there that was, correct? Seems to be a foul play. And neither of us is a doctor here, so I would just say it's a document that we would admit into the record um, for follow-up. But this is the copy that you received directly from 13 Baji. Exactly. Has the document been in your possession from that time? Exactly. March 2000 up until today? Exactly. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I seek the admission of um, the post-mortem report. We will, of course, conduct um, further investigations. Um, because we're not sure if this is the only report or if there have been subsequent reports in relation to the post-mortem. So it would be admitted as Exhibit 0071. Request granted. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, Mr. Job, from what you've told us, it is the interviews as well as this document that formed um, the basis of your investigations into exactly. Mr. Ibrahim Abari's death. After this meeting where um, Mr. 13 Baji gave you the post-mortem report, did the union take any other steps um, in relation to the death of Mr. Bari? The sub-union I'm talking about, your union. Yes, we, we do because like in this meeting, there were concerns being raised about the rest of the institutions in Brikama. Hence, we did that demonstration that Wednesday. So we took it, took it upon ourselves to go back to all the schools in Brikama the following day on the 24th, to sensitize and talk to all those schools within Brikama about our actions and that we do not want to see a repetition of that because now authorities are equally concerned and they've assured us that they are obviously going to do something about it. So we do not want to see any other plan or any other demonstration, which we did the following day. So in essence, you were reassuring the students that steps were being taken by the authorities exactly. and also condemning the acts of criminal damage that were done by protesters. Exactly. What happened after that? After this, an unusual 
meeting came about on a Friday. The following day, early morning, when we were at the college by 7 a.m., the interior minister came with the IGP to the college, and we were told we should have a meeting with them that early morning. So we went out worried and surprised as to why that early morning and why so equally very sudden and prompt. So we were called into the computer room at the Gambia College. And the meeting was chaired by Dr. Bojang, the then Dr. Bojang, who was then the vice principal. The meeting lasted for about only half an hour or even less than that. We saw a change in the tone of the voice of the IGP and the interior minister, Usman Baji. Can you give us the full names of the IGP at that time as Rex well as King. the interior minister? Rex Men King. Rex King, the IGP. And Usman Baji, the interior minister. And I just want to make sure this is correct. In your statement, it says Sankum Baji was the IGP. Is that an error? That must be an error, yes. That must, he was the deputy IGP. Okay. It was Rex King who was the IGP. So it was Rex King who was present exactly. as well as um, Interior Minister exactly. Usman Baji. Yes. Okay. Um, so you sense a different tone. In their voices. Mm -hmm. And it was this time very hard and harsh that they don't want to see any kind of this again, and if anybody try it, you will see what they're going to do to you. What and were they referring to? Huh? What were they referring to? That if anybody go out again on demonstration, you will see what is going to happen to you. So Aliu Khan, the president, uh, started uh, talking to them. Uh, but I couldn't stand it. I have to chip in, and I told them, uh, with due respect, I don't think we are afraid of anything. We are not afraid of anything. If there should be anything that will come our way, we believe we are, we are on a worthy course and we must see justice be done. That is why we are here. And, and, and uprootly, the meeting ended. So, two days prior, you were reassured from the meeting that you had with the authorities. Exactly. Including um, landing Baji, 13 Baji. Exactly. And then two days later, the meeting exactly. with the IGP and the um, Minister of Interior, you sensed a change in tone. What effect did that have on the union and plans to um, take any further action? That something, something not normal is, is happening because things are changing and we do not know why, as to why the sudden change in the whole process. So that was our stance. We made it clear to them. Well, we are on a worthy cause and we are, not, we are not obviously going to back out and we are not going to be afraid of anything. If it should come our way, we will take it because we've already seen the fate of this young Ibrahim Abari. So we are all putting our place or we are all putting ourselves in his place. That was obviously our stance. Was there, um, did the union hold any subsequent demonstration after the demonstration of 22nd March 2000? After hours, then there was a break. The Friday, the following Friday, which was, which was on the 31st of March, college closes for Easter. And we went on Easter break. And then the rest of the meetings continued, but Aliu then was representing the union because we are on Easter. That is Ali Ukan. Ali Ukan. And I then took it upon myself because I was a HTC student. I was supposed to uh, 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 file in my uh, uh, project for the completion of my program. So I took that time to make sure that I start doing something about my project. So I was obviously very busy while Ali was now uh, 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 acting on our behalf with the rest of the other Gamsu officials. 
So we only have 25 minutes left. Um, can you tell us about um, the subsequent demonstration? Exactly. Like I said, I was busy with my project. I always work during the night, very late at the night, and I go to sleep by 5 or 6 a.m. in the morning. So this particular day on the 9th April, I went to bed usually at around that time. So I was woke up by my younger brother that somebody is on the line, is calling you the following day on the 10th of April. I woke up and then went to receive the uh, telephone call. And it was Saja Kamara, my counterpart, the main union information minister, who was at the, end, at the other end of the uh, telephone line. Ask me whether if there is any demonstration going on at Bikama at that time. I said, anyway, I, I'm just coming out of bed. I don't know exactly whether there is any, and I am not even sure. He said, anyway, there is one happening here. People are out, and it's, it's turning violent, so I don't know. I said, okay, then uh, why not let me go back and see? Then that was the time I rushed into my house. So up until that point, you were not aware of the planning of another demonstration? I was aware, but I don't know the actual date, okay. like I said, because then Aliu now is, is taking, it, taking it up because we are on holidays, and I was also busy with my project. I was aware that there should be a demonstration uh, if they do not do something, but I don't know exactly when. If the authorities do not do something. Exactly. So when you found out on the 10th of April that a demonstration was indeed taking place, um, tell us what you did and what you observed. Then I went to the house, put on my gown, and, and I pick up my notebook with my student ID card. I rushed to, uh, uh, around the police station. And while I was going, all what I'm seeing is thick smoke, heavy smoke in the cloud. People running helter-skelter. Uh, people are shouting there is demonstration. So I walked past the police station. I saw the police station being burned down to ashes. Then I found a group of students now meeting, standing face to face with the, uh, 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 with the army officers around the road leading to Brikama Health Center, just opposite Njai Kunda. Uh, there is a bakery there. That was where students were standing, facing the security forces. So when I arrived... Around, sorry, around what time was this? This was between 11 and 12. And from what you've said, this was in the area of Brikama. Mm? The smoke that you saw, it was in Brikama. It was in Brikama, yes. It was in Brikama. You said you saw, um, was it the police station in flames? Exactly. Um, do you know who did that? I, 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 I can't say for certain at that time because I was just coming out from my house. So I would not know exactly who did it. And you said that um, people were running helter-skelter. What were they running away from, do you know? Yeah, because of what they saw. Just the commotion or were they being chased? Yeah, the commotion at the time. The commotion at the time, yes. Continue telling us what you observed. So, when I confronted the student group, most of them recognized me. Like I said, I was meeting with them constantly. Uh, most of them recognized me. So, I was there uh, standing with them, talking to them calming them down, telling them they should disperse uh, because things are getting out of hand and we were facing the soldiers. So all of a sudden I heard the voice, fire. And then all of a sudden a young man standing beside me fell on my feet, struggling for air, blood was coming out. I now understand things have turned terribly worse. So when you heard fire, what was actually being fired were live bullets. All sorts. Live bullets. Live bullets. And the person you said um, was shot next to you fell down and blood was oozing out of that person. Exactly. What happened to him? I was confused. I, I, I don't know exactly what, what I, 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 I am to do next. Then the rest of the student body now are running for their lives. And then the chasing started. Soldiers started chasing them, and the firing continues. So the individual that you said fell down, what happened to him? 
I, I believe he must have been taken to Brekama Health Center. That I couldn't confirm. But equally, along the line, I also understood that an unidentified body, up to the time of burial, I believe it was that young man at Brekama. So you told us that someone yelled fire and um, live bullets started um, being fired. You told us initially that when you got there, you saw soldiers. Were there any other security um, personnel present? All soldiers. There were all soldiers. Were there any police officers present? I didn't see any of the, any of the other outfits, security outfits there except soldiers. And the soldiers that you saw, um, do you recall um, what they were carrying? They were carrying their guns. Do you happen to know what kind of guns? I, I will not be able to know exactly what type of gun they are carrying, but I know they are obviously all armed. So all of a sudden, I, I had a voice, grab him, he's the, he's the, he's the informer. But before that, I just want to make sure this is clear for the record. The people who were firing, um, which led to the man next to you falling down, who you believe um, was dead, who were the people who actually fired? The soldiers. As far as you could tell, did anyone apart from the soldiers, was anyone else firing apart from the soldiers? All what I saw are the soldiers. No other body, no other person. Um, so please continue. What happened next? So like I said, I had a voice grab him, he's the informer. So they pounced on me and then they started hitting. Uh, who, who did that? The soldiers. And then the, their, their, their costa was standing by and then all of a sudden they were taking me, they are hitting me seriously with gun butts, with, with their hands, kicking me. And then all of a sudden I saw Modu Jaju. Then he was a driver. He was the driver to that uh, 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 mini costa. And he knew me because we go with the elder brother. So he asked them to stop. And then that was the time they stopped. Then they took me inside the van. So you may not know this, but I will ask you the question nonetheless. Do you by any chance know um, where those soldiers belong to? They go, like they, where they came from? They came from Yundum Barracks because they, I, they took me to Yundum Barracks and we all went there together. Apart from the coaster that you mentioned, were there any other vehicles there? No. At the time, could you tell who was in charge of the soldiers that were present? I, I, I couldn't. So from what you've said, the only person you recognize was um, Modu Jaju, Modu Jaju, Jaju exactly. the driver. Yes. And the soldiers who were beating you, did they cause any injuries? Uh, no, they don't. Do you recall how many of them were beating you? About four or five. And they were beating you with their gun butts? Yes. Did they do anything else to you? They were kicking as well, slapping. Um, do you recall how long that lasted? Oh, just briefly. It was just brief. And then Modu, Modu told them to stop because he knew me. He told them and then they stopped and then they took me into the van. When you were put in the van, were you the only one in the van or were I there other? I was the first person to be in the van. Did other individuals join you, other students, for instance? After my arrest, then the search continues. They were now moving. We started moving with, with them in, in, into, the, uh, into, into the interior of Brikama. They started now picking, arresting people until when the van was fully loaded. And then we, went, we were taken to Yunum Barracks. In terms of the people that they were arresting, um, were they just picking people off from the streets or were they um, go looking for specific individuals? As yeah, far they as were just tell? picking people from the street and houses. If they suspected you, they just grip you and then uh, put you in the van. So essentially mass arrests were conducted? Sure. Um, did you recognize any of the students that were arrested with you? I, 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 I don't. Apart from what happened to you, and you mentioned other individuals were arrested, did anything happen to any of those individuals during their arrest, as yes. far as you know? When, when we were taken to Yundum Barracks, 
I was specifically taken to a cell, and the rest were taken to a hall. And I was made to understand that those who were taken to the hall, uh, over, over, over almost ever, over 100 people, we are being beaten from that time until the following day. They were being beaten by who? The soldiers. At Union Barracks? Exactly. How did you find out about this information? Because the following day, in the morning, they took us around their premises to pick up that, which we did. And after that, they took me to join uh, the rest of those uh, uh, people at the hall. So essentially, not only were people arrested and beaten, they were also um, forced to pick up litter from around the barracks. Yes. And then taken back inside. Did you recognize any of the soldiers at this point while you were at Yundum Barracks? Yes, I recognized another neighbor, which is just uh, a stone throw from my house. But he, he was, I think he was an onlooker. Uh, because the soldiers were inside with those in the hall. And I, I, I could still remember this guy who they said uh, was, uh, came from one of the cells in one of the police stations that was broken into. And he was used as an entertainer at that hall there. He would be asked to dance and they would be, they would be clapping and, 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 and if the soldiers, they are not satisfied, they would still hit him. I have seen that with my eyes. And then while uh, this boy was, was, was standing, uh, this soldier, Dauda Koli, just a neighbor, was standing. So when he saw me, I, I saw them talking to one another with the other soldiers he was standing with. So the person that you said was taken from the cell and made to dance for the soldiers, was that um, one of the people that was arrested with your batch? No, he was not taken at the cell. He was at the main hall. I was the only one, those who were brought from Brikama, I was the only one being taken to the cells. I believe because of uh, 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 being a student leader. And then the rest, they were all taken to the main hall. So he was one of the people who was arrested and taken to the main hall. Exactly. And the soldiers f forced them to dance for them. Yes, exactly. While exactly. they clapped. And if they were not satisfied, they would be hitting him. I have seen that. And this is something you witnessed personally. Yeah, ex exactly. Within Yundum Barracks, do you remember where you were held? Where were the cells located? Do you remember? I could remember this is a big building behind the mosque. There is a big building there, and it has a bigger parlor, and then it has a corridor inside. In that corridor, there are two rooms there, the other one this way, the other one facing this way. That was where I was, the other one on the right hand side, that, that was where I was locked up. You mentioned that um, the people who were arrested with you were beaten um, the day that you were arrested until the next day, from what you heard. Those who were in at the, the main at the hall. hall, yes, yes. Exactly. Yes. Um, do you recall who told you that information? I, when I was taken there, I was sitting with one of the guys. He showed me the back, what happened. I saw the lacerations. <coughs> yes. So you were taken to the hall um, afterwards to Just join? Just briefly. Like briefly. I said, after collecting that, that, I was taken there. So when I saw this neighbor, like I said, I started seeing them. They were talking to one another. Then all of a sudden, then they just took me back to the cells. Did you notice any other injuries of en on any of the other um, people who were arrested? Apart from the one that, that I was uh, sitting near, yes. What kind of injuries did you notice? Similar injuries or different ones? Yeah, exactly. Similar laceration on the back. Did, they, did any of them tell, tell you anything else about how they were treated, apart from the yes, beatings they that were, they mentioned? Yes, like I said, they were malhandled. They were being beaten all throughout. What else happened um, while you were at Yundum Barracks? 
So I was at Yundum Barracks. That same day we were brought in, uh, soldiers were now shouting, insulting our mothers. They will come and when they saw us in the cells, they will start shouting, uh, oh, guy is not here. If he comes back, we are going to kill all of you. You are the opposition children. Lot of comments about us. Did you understand who was being referred to as Oga? Yeah, Ajame, of course. At the time, do you know if he was in the country or not? He was not. So, from what you told us, there was um, a soldier called Dauda Koli. Mm -hmm. um, what role, if any, did he play? I didn't see him play any role apart from just standing outside the hall looking at what was going on in the hall. Apart from him, did you recognize any other soldier? I, I did not. The only one I recognized was the one insulting us the day I was arrested. That was Solo Bojang. He still lives in Prikama, Nyambai. So prior to that day, you knew, um, you knew Solo Bojang. Is that correct? Prior to that, exactly. So you were able to identify him on that day? Sure. Do you by any chance know um, his rank? I, 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 I think he's, 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 he was rankless at that time. And from what you said, he um, lived in Brickham and continues to live in Brickham. I believe so, yes. Um, what else happened at Yundum Barracks apart from Until on Friday, on the 14th of March, later in the day, by midday, I was called out. I was taken to the main gate by the Red Barracks. So they brought in... Who are the Red Berets? They, those are the soldiers, at the, just if you enter the, the Yunnum Barracks. I don't know, I are military police. I was made to understand they are called military police. Please continue, yep. So I, I, they brought a pickup. They asked me to go inside and they brought another two trucks. They brought the two trucks. All the others, I think most of the detainees in the hall were also uh, brought in and put into those trucks. And then I was put in the pickup, sandwiched by two military police officers, one in front and another, I think two or one at the back. Just to clarify something, prior to leaving Yundum Barracks, um, were you tortured at any point, apart from what happened when you were arrested? No, apart from the time of my arrest, I was never tortured until my release, okay. to be quite honest. So Maybe tell us, can, sorry, yes. Please tell us where the military police took you. They took me to police headquarters. This was on a Friday. I could still remember Yomal Asura. It falls on the Yomal Asura day. We left Yundum Barracks. We arrived at the police headquarters, I think by around after two. And upon arrival, I believe my arrival must have been uh, communicated because the lady police officer I found, I was taken straight to the, their communication room upstairs. The police officer I found at the communication room, once I arrived, I believe, like I said, she must have been told about my coming. She was very much sympathetic when, he, when she saw me. And then quickly she asked whether I had been communicating with my uh, family. I said, no, he said, come, come, come. Then I went inside another room next to the communication room and then he handed over a telephone to me to call my family. And then I quickly did that. I started talking to my family members and then all of a sudden when he had somebody coming, then we, we stopped. Was that the first time that your family members knew um, what had happened to you? No, that was not the first time because before I left Yundum, they came to visit me. Okay. Yes. And you were at Yundum from the 10th of April? Yes. Um, which was a Monday, from what you've said? Yes. Until Friday? Yes. So for about four days? Yes. Um, tell us about what happened after um, that lady allowed you to call your family, the police officer. After that, I, I, they had lunch. After that, they had lunch. I saw almost all the security heads 
at the police headquarters within the police. Uh, the IGP, Deputy IGP, Ablai Sanyam, PRO at the time, Commissioner of Admin, Babu Karso at the time, because he was also a neighbor, I know him. Uh, they were all there. And uh, they gave me a good lunch, because that was, for the first time, I, I had a very good meal. Domoda with meat, that was what was given to me. So after that, I was asked to join them in their conference room. Around conference, a squared one, I was put in the middle on camera and recorded with all the security heads. And they, they started their interview, one after the other. Can you tell us the names of the security heads that were present, either their names or their positions? Who were they? I know the IGP was there. The deputy IGP was also there. Tatin Baji was there. Babukar So was there, then Commissioner Operations. Uh, sorry, Admin, I believe. Because he was in Nebo, so I know him. He was there. Anyone else that you recognize? Ablai Sanyang PR or police PR, I believe, was also there. And other uh, police commissioners, whom I don't, I could not know their names. What kind of questions were you asked during the interview? In relation to how everything started up to what I know about the whole incident. I think it lasted for almost about two, two and a half hours. And what happened to you after that interview? After that, I was handed over to... Tijan Ba, an NIA officer who escorted me to the NIA, head, uh, to the NIA, yes, NIA headquarters that Friday evening where I was detained for another six, seven days. Did anything happen to you at the NIA headquarters? No, not actually. No physical torture, actually. I was being escorted by Tijan Ba, an NIA officer, and right when you enter the NIA building or premises, the building you will see, there is a house or there is a corridor as well, just like the other one. There are two cells. In the first cell, I found a serolunion there. In the second cell, I found Nakulan Sise, our advisor, the student union, sub-union advisor. Nakulan Sise was there. And I also found Pa Alassan Sise, the treasurer of Gamsu. Were you taken to the NIA premises on your own, or were you in a group of detainees? I was the one taken alone. Um, how long, you said you spent about six or seven days at yes, the NIA? Yes, yes, around that. After that, were you released, or did something else happen to no, you? No, I was transferred back to police headquarters to join uh, uh, another three student leaders, Ali Khan, Sinabu Gay, Babukar An, I, I, I found them at, 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 at the police headquarters. We spent almost about two, three days there again. In total, how much time did you spend in detention? I think almost about 16 days. Were you charged at any point? And I, I could not remember. We were by a team of lawyers led by Usman Silla. Uh, they did a lot for us uh, and order uh, Gambian lawyers, Bar Association, and uh, including Aliu Dabo, the then uh, president, Student Union, University of the Gambia, did a lot in making sure that we are being released, and other people within and outside the Gambia. So after about 16 days, you were eventually released. And I want to put these two things because they are, they are of importance. At the NIA headquarters, these three people, uh, these two people, including myself, three, were the Fritonian. His story is so sad. I think I believe his name is, if I'm not forgotten, Stephen. He has been crying and he has been praying all throughout. A very faithful Christian I have ever seen. He said to me, I ran away from a civil war in my country, only to come to the Gambia to be arrested. I, I don't know exactly where I am, and I think I spent almost about only a few days in the country, and then it coincided with this demonstration, and he was arrested. So he, sp he spent some time there, and he was very keen. I could remember every early morning 
By 5 a.m., he will start prayers, and he will call us we, uh, to get up and pray along with him. And there was this morning, he said, today they're going to, re they're going to re uh, uh, release me, and it, and it happened. We prayed together, and they, when early morning they came, he was released. And Buba Samura, the... So just to be clear, the Sierra Leonean that you mentioned was not connected in any way with the demonstrations, but was arrested yes. in connection with the demonstrations. Yes. Please continue. And we, I also found Buba Samure there, the, the National Assembly member for Kiang East at the time. I met him because I was taken there on Friday, because at NI headquarters we are only given one, one, one meal, that is lunch by 2 o'clock, and it's Benachin every day. So, it's, and it's a small basin. We four, five of us will share the benachin. And he will be brought out from his cell to join us to have lunch, Buba Samore. So when he met me that Saturday while at lunch, he was pale, exhausted, and he started asking me, he said, Nding, where are you from? I, I told him, I, I said, I'm from Brikama. He said, who is your father? And I told him about my father. I said, my father is Keva Jube. He said, I, I know your father. And then he started bursting into tears. He said he's been kept in a dark cell where he could not see anything. And they will get into the cell during nighttime and will be beaten. Did he tell you why he was arrested? He said it was in connection to the demonstration because the, uh, we are, in, fa in fact, the conclusion at the NIA headquarters, at three occasions we have been called to give our statements. For me, when they took me to give out my statement, it will take them, it will take me two, three hours. So Hydra in particular will complain. I said, you, are, you cannot complain because what I know is what I'm going to write. I, I cannot sort in my story because I have a story to tell. And at the end, what they concluded was we are all opposition children. That was what they concluded. The opposition were behind us. Um, what's the name of this Hydra that you mentioned? I, I can't remember the first name, but I know he's either a fine complexion guy. Um, in your statement, it states Sheikh Tijan Haider. Uh -huh. Is that correct? It, 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 then it must be the one. Um, after you were released, um, and I need to wrap this up because we have run out of time. After you were released, did you come across any other post-mortem report regarding what happened to Ibrahim Abari? I understood there was one that was, that they did, I believe it was exhumed and another post-mortem, I understood, that was narration, that because they said they were not satisfied with this first one, because then at the time they said Dr. Sam was the pathologist and was not in the country, and then the Cuban, uh, Dr. R uh, Rafael Rizzo did the uh, post-mortem. So, they did another one, I made to understand. And where did you understand that? When uh, from did you narration, from narration. I think from even papers, uh, from newspapers, if I'm not forgotten, yes. And from the narration that you heard, what was different about the new post-mortem report from what you understood? Uh, the only change, uh, the only difference will be this one perhaps will contain something favorable to the authorities. That's what you understood from what you heard? Yes. But you did not actually see the report? Exactly. That's my understanding. Finally, in your post as um, information minister within the subunion, were you, um, did you come across the names of individuals that were actually killed? during the demonstrations of April 10 and 11? Yes, from newspapers that I have gathered, I have uh, the names of those who were killed. Can you tell us those names? Usman Sabali is one of them, uh, from Brikamaba, who was only 15 years old. Omar Baro, a Red Cross volunteer. Mohamed Lamin Jai from Fonyi, uh, a GTTI student. Kalisko Prera. Mubun Lamin Chun, Latikunda, Junior Secondary School at the time, Regina Carol, Karamo Baro, Ice Senior Secondary School at the time, Lamin Ebojang, Nusra Senior Secondary School, uh, Bamba Jobate, 
Abdullah Sanyang, a three-year-old from Joswang. Uh, Burama Baji, 10 years old, Talending. We Mansali, Talending, Islamic Institute. Uh, and the 13th one, I believe, was the young man I spoke about that was shot at Brikama because I believe I was made to understand up to the time of burial they could not identify the body. And later, uh, reading through the uh, uh, Forea newspaper, I came across another name that is Seni Nyabali, which took place at Brikama Bar. And in fact, you have provided a stack of newspapers to the Commission's um, investigators, and we will go through that information, um, which we received recently. From what you found out, um, how did the three-year-old die? I, I, I met to, uh, from the newspaper, I think it is true stampede. The three-year-old died as a result of stampede. The last question from me is, considering everything that happened, um, everything that you witnessed, what happened to you as well, what impact did this, um, the events of April 10 and 11 have on you? On me, in particular. On you in particular, as well as um, other students that you know. On me, I, I think, except the positive aspect, because I, I have prepared for this from day one. I, I read a lot of good things about good people all over the world, equally as about dictators, about very terrible dictators for that matter. Kamusu Banda is one such. So uh, going through, because that, in fact that was what I went with uh, when I found Alassane Palas and crying all throughout. I told him, you, you better remember Nelson Mandela as, 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 as an icon, that's the only way out. We are in seat already, because anything could happen. So we have to obviously know that things are serious. A lot of lives, property has already been damaged. So that impact on me, I would say, I learned a lot, was a learning point for me. But on the part of the union or unionism, it has paralyzed unionism in the country, <coughs> particularly Gamsu because we saw an emergency of a fake union or student body called NAPSA that represented the affairs of the students of this country. When you say fake, what do you mean by that? Who um, initiated that group, NAPSA? When, when in actual fact people are called student, students association, when some of them are not students, they've already finished school. You put in them together, you call them students. Do you know who controlled that group? Uh, yeah, Ajame, of course. Did he control the group through any individual in particular? Did he control the group through a particular individual at the time? I guess so. Who was that? Uh, I think Sidi Jai was one of them. Because later he was nominated to be part of the National Assembly, so that also speaks volumes. Mr. Chairman, I probably shouldn't have said that was my last question, but I will ask another question just now. Um, after the events of April 10 and 11, did you or members of the union have a meeting with then President Yaya Jame? Yeah, after the Latte Commission, when we were being summoned to the Latte Commission for the public disturbances of the April 10 and 11, the report according to uh, when he received it, invited us as a group, and we went there. Uh, he spoke about a lot of things, that he will do everything possible to make sure that nothing is, no stone is left on throne to make sure justice has been served. And at the end of the day, that was the end of the story. Was anything done as a result of? I, I, could, not, I could not remember. Aware of any measures that were taken? I, 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 I I'm not. Mr. Job, thank you very much for your testimony and for appearing before the Commission on such short notice. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have concluded. I hand over to the Commissioners for additional questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Chairman Council, and thank you very much, Chairman, Mr. Job, uh, for your testimony. Before I turn to the Commissioners, if they have any questions to pose. 
just a small anecdote. It never occurred to me that 19 years after what we heard in Havana, Cuba, we struggled the morning of the 10th and 11th of April. I was in Havana with the Secretary General of the United Nations, Kofi Annan, and uh, the Secretary General is briefed every morning by his press secretary, and uh, we get briefing from the Department of Political Affairs on developments around the world. When uh, the briefing notes I came, we looked at it, and there were two references to developments in the Gambia. And uh, of course, he just turned to me and said, Lamin, you don't have troubles in your country, but it seems as if uh, these things are getting to be a bit uh, serious. He wanted to know quickly what, uh, what the developments were here. I mean, the, the violence that was going on, the killing of the students, because if we had detailed information, we were planning on having a meeting with the Gambian delegation that uh, President Jami was heading. He was only a few uh, meters away from us, the UN delegation where we were seated, and uh, uh, we didn't get that. That information didn't come, the detailed information didn't come. And as I said, this is a, a twist in life that 19 years later, here I am sitting here, hearing those details that perhaps would have uh, made it possible for the Secretary General of the United Nations to meet with uh, Jame to um, try to make sure that uh, things don't get out of hand in uh, the Gambia, notwithstanding the slaughter of um, uh, young students in the area. Just a small anecdote, but he was there with um, his own delegation, Jame, and uh, in that big hall, uh, Anand turned to me at some point and said, uh, he would say, your friend. He said, your friend has got this big telephone sitting right on his desk in the big hall in the area. He was communicating with the Gambia with what was going on here and uh, monitoring that. Uh, but anyway, thank you so much, Emma. As I said, it was a 19-year wait for me to hear exactly what really some, uh, uh, happened. He was very much concerned about Gambia. He loved Gambia. He loved Gambians. Uh, ironically, yesterday was uh, the first anniversary of his passing away, so. Kofi Annan. Um, and uh, to hear a day later the details just um, uh, got me uh, a bit moved. But commissioners, if you have any questions, yeah, uh, Commissioner Jones, have the floor, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Mr. Job, I have one forlorn question um, regarding the widespread allegations um, that Mr. Ibrahima was um, fed cement. Um, you said your investigations revealed that this was not the case, right? Do you know what um, gave birth to the allegations, the widespread allegations, that that was in fact the case with him? Uh, I believe it must have been sparked by because others have it that he was asked to carry bags of cement. But the point of eating cement obviously was denied by the father vehemently. And even Alaji, Gianna, do not say anything about that. Because they said Ibrahim didn't tell them anything about that. What he told them and what he emphasized, particularly to uh, Alaji, was he was mercilessly being beaten. He confirmed that. Water poured on him repeatedly. He, wo uh, he was asked to monkey dance, and his hair shaved off. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Carr. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Job. Um, part of our mandate includes um, investigating institutional failures that led to some of these human rights um, violations and abuses. So pardon me if I ask a question or that has been asked already. But my first question is, do you, since you've been in the education sector for long, I want to know whether 
uh, there is anything regarding um, disciplinary policy within the sector. Uh, I, I believe there are uh, policies around discipline or disciplinary issues within the school system that I know. Uh, but at the level of the ministry, I, 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 I can't say for certain. But I know at the level of the schools, we do have policies. Thank you. So then that brings me to the second question, which is, would you say um, that the taking Mr. Barry, the late Mr. Barry to the fire service, would you say that conforms to um, those disciplinary policies within the school system? Yeah, that was what obviously when everything started with that, everything went against that policy. And that was why when we realized it, our force thing we thought of was to talk to the students about matters of discipline and to even urge the school administration not to ever involve a third party in the discipline or in the disciplinary aspect of students because the end result is always going to be uh, a, a problematic or negative uh, effect. Thank you. My final question is, do you know if the then ministry, the leadership of the then ministry did anything to investigate um, the incident? Well, I think the then ministry were hypocritical. They were hypocrites in the whole episode of Ibrahim Abari. So many things that they, they did, uh, because after the press release of the then president, uh, you saw the teachers' union, the uh, conference of principals, you saw parents uh, uh, coming together to ban students from being part of Gamsu. So you could see the hypocrisy in what uh, the, the Department of State of Education did at that time. In fact, at some point, Thresh Ndong, in one of the uh, narrations in a press briefing, they did congratulated or applauded the government for the way they handled the crisis in a press briefing. So you could see that. And after when we graduated from college, we were all posted to region five and six, all of us. So you could see their hypocrisy. One more question, Mr. Chairman. This is just something I thought of now. This is in reference to, since a lot of you were also arrested and detained um, at either the NIA or the Gambia Police Force, was there subsequent attempts to monitor you and to, to, to uh, issue threats to any of the executive members of GAMSU? There, there were, of course. In fact, at some point, one of the reasons why I kept all these reference materials is because we want to tell our story. Myself and Ali Khan wanted to write our story into a book. We even spoke to uh, an institution, which I will not name here. They even gave us the assurance that they will help. But at some point, somewhere along the line, they turned against what they said or what they promised. And then we realized that somebody somewhere is monitoring. And that has been the case. From that on, in fact, all the tertiary institutions, you have NIA officers within, you have Yes, you have police officers with it. Even at our badge, you have NIA officers as students, part of the program. So anything that you are doing at the college, of course, is their problem. They are informed about it. So obviously, it was. Thank you very much. Thank you, Imam C, followed by Commissioner Kinte. Imam C. Sajok, Bintamane, Mujongen, Mujongen, Kam Kikolef. Uh, Bintamane, did you eventually get to know who raped her? Well, I, at some point, what I made to understand was, after all this, a, a, a parade was mounted for her to identify who raped her, her, but I think he could not, or a wrong person was identified, something like that. I think that was what I made to understand after that. 
Thank you very much, Amikusun um, Akinde. Thank you, Mr. Job. It has been uh, really traumatizing to go through the experience. Uh, thank God, this one avenue, all these institutions you talk about, I had it. I was president of the sub-union of the college, president of the main union, one of the founders of uh, um, Gamsu, and became the first president. Um, I just narrated this because there was an event uh, when I was president. There was an accident uh, around um, along the way in Banjul in which uh, two students died on the spot and three were taken to intensive care. And that was a bus tire of the vehicle. Uh, sometimes it depends on the handling. My, my expectation, or at that time, my instinct said, if you call or allow students to come together, you first have to answer the question of, management. If you cannot answer it adequately, don't venture. Try to do preventive measures. For me, in my strategy, what I did, Gambia High School was set, St. Augustine, all these high schools and secondary schools. I went to the college principal, Jenung, and said, please allow me the college telephone for two, three hours. I got to all principals who invited all head boys and head girls. I had dialogue and said I was coming around. And I was given a vehicle and I went around all the schools and diffused a demonstration. That was going to be very serious because they were going to burn the, all, almost everywhere in Banjul with burn tires, uh, um, um, old tires. What I did was I took the bull by the horn and attacked the government and the police. Peter Gomez will be a, a live witness, he's, he's around. He gave me space in the radio. I condemned the, the, the the government, most of the police. I was almost arrested. But then there was no strike. That, in fact, that was the event when these taxis of 14 passengers were moved from 16 to 14 passengers. And then more uh, serious uh, uh, inspection of uh, transports were done. Because what I said was, uh, transport tires will be worn out. The police don't care about the wear out of the and uh, wipers, uh, signals, and so on, they're only looking for the $5 and the $10. Peter asked a question and said, you want to tell me the police are corrupt? I said, from the inspector general to the rank and file. That was a live program. Um, now, we have, we have experienced a similar thing. Just not long ago, a gentleman died in the hands of the police, allegedly. Um, people who came out may have had an organized way and intention to go about it. But they did not um, look at the management part of it. If we go, can we manage it? Like you, you had in your case in Brikama also. When you went out, your intention was just to go and read your statement to the commissioner and so on, which is in good faith and is in place. And you went to pay condolence, that's, that's great. But it went out of hands because people with uh, uh, some other interest, vested interest, you, you, you know, added onto your number and you could not control it. It has repeated this year or it has come about this year also. I would want in your concluding remarks, what uh, do you pro uh, propose or advise about demonstrations uh, uh, at any level in the country? Thank you. Thank you very much, um, uh, uh, Mr. Job. If you have any concluding remarks, um, can you, you've already been invited. <laughs> Fine. Okay, please please I, proceed. I, I think we are very much grateful to the Gambians during those hard times. That was the time you could also see how Gambians are peace-loving and helping so many people within the country and outside the country in the diaspora added their voice at the international community to make sure that student leaders are being released 
which was obviously great. Like I said, Usman Silla was made to understand because he led or he led that uh, uh, decision to take the matter to court until when we were released. In addition to that, I think peace is the most important thing that is for everything. And it must start with oneself. We have to peace, we have to be with, with peace with ourselves first. And then extend it to others so that that peace can be maintained. But peace goes together with truth, being truthful. And the Gambian problem, we are all Gambians, but truth is our problem. You walk into public offices, you tell people the simple truth. They will sideline you, they will take you for an enemy, they will label you as an arrogant, they will see you as otherwise, just because you want things to be the way they're supposed to be not because of convenience. And I think we need to understand this. And I think the Secretary General, the head of the civil service, need to take note of this. Public service regulations need to be respected. People should not take public service regulations for their own convenience to do things otherwise. It is high time for us to understand this. People have potentials, you walk into offices, there are no terms of references. You walk into those offices, the manager or the boss tend to know all, tend to take care of everything. And if those references are not there, you cannot obviously tell the manager, look, this is where you're supposed to stop. This is where I should stop and this is where you're supposed to take. So I think the government of the day needs to look at this seriously. One such example I have seen, like in the teaching service, schools have been open almost every academic year. Those schools are not being classified. They are not being categorized. Those people leading those schools or managing those schools, they have no budgetary line within the national budget. When people in those offices, permanent secretaries, directors, having their dues, and those poor teachers, senior masters, principals, whose positions are not even being recognized. And I wonder sometimes when the National Assembly, which has a composition of almost about 60% of its members being teachers, could not still do any serious thing about teachers. And the teaching fraternity provides that basis for development of this country. We need to know that and we need to understand that. Where are those budgets? The Sustainable Development Goal 4 is about, is about, is about, is about universal access to education. And how do we attain universal access to education when we do not build schools, when we do not upgrade schools? But if you build schools, if you upgrade schools, the consequences or the budgetary implications, are they being taken care of by the government? And this is what the National Assembly is supposed to answer. And this is what the National Assembly is supposed to understand. It is very unfair the way teachers are being treated. Already there is a promotional crisis in the Ministry of Basic and, Edu uh, Basic and Second Education. Yes. Because no room for expansion. Promotion is strictly based on who comes first, not based on merit. And we said we're supposed to have a civil service that has to rely on merit. Where will we go? I think it is high time for this government to look into those issues. On that note, I 
Thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you very much indeed, um, uh, Mr. Job, uh, for your testimony. We will um, uh, end the day here and uh, come back tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. Meeting is adjourned.